All right, so it's 4.05 and uh, I think it's time to start the show. Uh, this is episode 21 of Burrows and Burbs and I'm very excited to uh, introduce our two guests, Anna Shagalov and Bo Poulsen, uh, who are part of the Poulsen Shagalov team in Manhattan. And I believe your particular expertise, Bo, is eco-friendly and energy efficient buildings. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that. And I think Anna Shagalov's particular expertise is, tell me if I'm wrong, the lower half of Manhattan. Um, yeah, I mean, when you, when you do this as long as I have, it's, I mean, it's kind of all within the realm of expertise at this point, <laughs> but thank you. Well, I heard that you were particularly good at the lower half of Manhattan, but then Roberto said, but then again, she sold $30 million in the Benson. So I guess she really is expert at the whole, the whole island. Uh, well, that's a, that, that was, that was Bo's contact actually. And it was a, 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 from, from, since the time that Bo and I paired up, it's been a team effort. So. All right. So I'm going to put the Benson on the screen and, uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about the Benson and why it matters? Wow. Um, why does it matter? It matters because- Neftali's listening. <laughs> it matters because there's very few well-designed um, new developments that really fit in with the neighborhood. And I think the Benson is that. You know, it, it's a 15 CPW type of building where, you know, uh, they had Peter Penry, they had, um, uh, um, uh, blanking on their architect, uh, Yellowbird um, um, design team in there. They, they just had a, they had a great design team in there um, and it just fits into Madison and it's a small boutique building. Uh, there are very few apartment buildings that only have, I believe there's 16 units in the building. And um, my buyers actually were looking for a townhouse in the area. And they decided on this because they could do a combination of two apartments, which are both full floors, and then also have the services of, you know, a five-star luxury building. Okay. Were they foreign buyers? They were not. They were uh, they were locals, but they never saw it, right? That's the story. Uh, they never they never saw it. Never went to the showroom. Uh, I've worked with them for years. Um, you know, rented them a bunch of apartments, and uh, we've been looking for a sale for uh, for I don't even I, years, uh, four or five, six years, something like that. So yeah, you know the story. It's minimum wage. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when it all comes together, yes. <laughs> but yeah no i mean yeah it, it's just a it's a great building um you know it's yeah. got a it's, it's got some central park views even though it's not on fifth avenue and um you know you can't beat the location right there on madison just curious when they decided to look at a building like that did you introduce them to just that one building or when they saw that they're like okay we'll consider this and should we look at two or three others just to compare uh, we looked at just a couple other buildings, but there was nothing that compared to it. There was nothing else out there. Um, they didn't want to be on like Billionaire's Row. You know, there was nothing along those lines that they wanted to be on. There's, there's just so few boutique buildings that are west of, of Lexington up there. And, and they wanted to be on the Upper East Side, obviously, for, uh, or not obviously, but they wanted to be on the Upper East Side for, for schools and stuff. So they, you know, most of the new developments are east of uh, are east of Lex. Yeah. Did they stay within the same price point for the townhouse and the apartment, more or less? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they probably could have gotten a townhouse for for less than that, but you know, there's there there's also you know when you buy an apartment like that, you know, it's a full floor, right? So you don't have wasted space when you're when you're when you're living vertically. It's very different than living horizontally, and I think it's a lot easier for to live horizontally than it is to, to live vertically. Um, no, I have, I I have a client, I have a client, a family, and they actually decided against the townhouse because they felt that they would not, it would not lend to them being a close family because everybody would be all spread out on different floors. It's true, so. it's true. I mean, I get winded every day walking to the third floor. <laughs> <laughs> 
there's mean, nothing green design... about that building though, right? What was that, sorry? There's nothing green or eco-friendly about that building. No, unfortunately, you know, there was nothing, there was nothing that really, I mean, they, they use, you know, good quality sure. insulated windows and their insulation is okay, but no, there was nothing there that, uh, that appealed to my sense of eco-friendliness, unfortunately. But um, we did stipulate in, in, um, in the purchase that all paints had to be no VOC, uh, the glues that they're using for a lot of things, you know, should be low VOC, all those types of things. So that's actually something that we, uh, that we asked about. And, and Naftali actually was, was pretty, uh, was, was very open and forthcoming with that. And, and most of the products that they were using were, were low VOC uh, products to begin with. Did that come from the buyer or did you impose that? Uh, I think it came from both. You know, I mean, I think the buyer knows what my sentiment is towards sustainability and towards healthy living. So it came from it came from both sides. But they okay. they're super. I mean, my clients are, are 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 extremely you know sort of health and environmentally conscious as well. So it, it just flowed well, you know, parallel. So I want to turn to a Anna as well, and I want to hear. I want to hear how the team came together. I know that you came from starting, Bo started in, in, in Russia of all places, and then came over here to Atlanta and found your way to New York. But Anna has been in New York since the very beginning. How did you guys uh, get started as a team? And tell us how the partnership evolved. Well, Bo and I have known each other since the beginning of our careers. And when we first met, we were instant friends. It was very easy. We both have very kind of laid back personalities and we just like to be as real as we can with each other. And we hit it off right away. So we were friends from the, from the get go. Um, and Bo, Bo was at a couple of different firms. Um, Bo, you were at City Habitats Town. And then and when, when he a finally short, came- A was, short yeah. stint of compass. And a short, yeah. I mean, oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So then, so when, when it was announced, there was this big announcement that Bo Paulson team was, um, was coming to Halstead and it was in one of our company meetings and I'm texting him going, no way, are you really here? And uh, we were very excited. And, and then do I tell them the, the, what really happened, Bo, at the deal <laughs> sure. of the year? It, it involves some of this. No, just kidding. This is no, it's this. not. That's not <laughs> it. Um, so we're at deal, deal of the year and we're talking. We realized we had some clients and friends that overlapped. So after a few shots of tequila, I said to Bo, um, yeah, we should team up. And I, went, I had actually been looking for something for a while because I was, I was a solo shop for, for, for like 17 years at that point. I, I had um, assisted Barbara Gosson for my first couple of years. And then after that, I was on my own and I really wanted to team up and collaborate and do bigger things. And uh, he looked at me, he gave me this look like, hmm, we should talk tomorrow. And the next day, we we're trying to figure out whose name come, came first. <laughs> Bo Wan, <Juan>, obviously. <laughs> but it's, oh, it's okay. been really seamless. It's been really wonderful. I think that's a fantastic turn of phrase. I, I was ready to team up and do bigger things. And I do. I want to hear about how the partnership works and how you guys feed off of each energy, sure. off of each other's energy, and how you complement each other in order to win these big deals, do big deals, you know, and and how it feeds the creativity. So t talk talk to me more about how you guys work together. Yeah, I mean, we 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 like to have ideas. We think we like to say we think outside the box. We're like sometimes way outside the box that you almost have to reel us in. But we like to keep things really interesting and creative. Just a little bit. Um, <laughs> we like to keep things interesting. And for me, I had all these ideas, but I I was I, I didn't have the courage to do these things on my own um, because there's a lot of financial um, expenses that that you know you have to deal with on your own. And if something fails. You know, and there's also just the, the collaborative efforts that I was really, really missing. And um, I know I know Bo's work ethic. He knew mine. Um, we had done some deals together in the past. Uh, we both knew how we communicated with other people and uh, what what was what was important to us as far as being ethical, being uh, fair. Um, it, it's never really the dollar signs that we're looking for. It's really just to service people in a way that they deserve to be serviced. 
Um, so breaking the mold of what a broker used to mean. And I, I think there's a lot of people that do that now, which is great. Um, but I mean, it's really, it's the events that we do now. So it's not really the bigger deals. It's more of the capacity of the marketing and co-hosting things and doing webinars and doing panel discussions and being able to just brainstorm with somebody that understands your way of thinking. And, you know, we've never said to each other, that is the, that is the worst idea I've ever heard. Never. Because there's everything always deserves to at least be discussed and to, com to communicate. And if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. But we've tried a number of things and um, everything has been wonderful. How but I think, I think it's also, sorry, I was just going to say, I think it's also great to have a sounding board. You know, it's somebody exactly. who you really feed off of and and Anna's great that way. I mean, and and you know, I think what she was alluding to, and 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 uh, um, I appreciate Anna actually not throwing me under the bus, but she should have. Is that sometimes I get some harebrained ideas, and sometimes you need. I was going to say that off camera. <laughs> sometimes you need somebody to like reel you in and be like, "Listen, let's focus on the most important things." You know, where where do we need to focus right now? Especially like during something like a pandemic and things like that. Where you know, where where's our core business, and and you know, how do we refocus on that? Because real estate's a roller coaster. I mean, you know, you, you guys know all the emotions we go through and everything like that. You know, we're always on a constant roller coaster, and so I think it's great to have somebody who. Um, who can somebody sometimes also like give you the hockey check and be like, whoa, all right, slow down there. <laughs> you know? But I've and, never called any idea stupid. <laughs> never. No, no, no. no. <laughs> Not I, yet. I, I, no, no, no. Never said <laughs> um, so, so how are you guys set up? You guys are the two principal people in your partnership. And then you have yes. who, who kind of tears down from you? We have, uh, we have Kristen, who's our, um, who's our coordinator. So she basically takes care of, you know, everything that we have um, and she's transitioning over to uh, being one of our main uh, agents as well uh, because we're bringing somebody new in that actually just started. Um, she comes from, uh, um, um, Anna and I know her from like the title business, Many but years. she's actually going to be doing, uh, Luciana is going to be doing all our, um, all our coordinating, our social media, yeah. She was in legal. She was in title. She's yep. she's she's very she's very well rounded when it comes to real estate. Yeah, and then we have uh, we have Lena, who is uh, a little bit sort of more under the radar. She has uh, great contacts, but she basically is you know somebody who um, that we work with through through her to 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 acquire clients. And uh, then unfortunately we lost uh, one of our very good agents, Zoe. Um, she's Australian. She had to move back, back to Australia. Um, Although she did uh, just do a couple of deals from Australia. She did just do a couple of deals. Yeah. <laughs> so she's still, actually, really she's still doing a ton of deals. So we, we've actually, I think we got three or four in the pipeline with her, but yes. Yeah. So, so she's actually doing more deals from Australia than she was here in New York. <laughs> <laughs> Which is great. We love it. So uh, I want to remind everybody who's who's watching that uh, it's no mere partnership. Together, you've done over five hundred million dollars worth of sales, right? I mean, this is a long-standing partnership, hugely successful. You guys are doing something right together, and yet you've also carved out, I think, an identity uh, for this brand in the market for being particularly good at green building. Is that right? So can you talk about, you know, wh where did that come from and how does that help the team? Well, I think that was one of those things that was, you know, part of the collaborative thing. You know, when Anna and I first started talking about, you know, uh, partnering up together, uh, I was already sort of very focused on trying to, to um, uh, promote green buildings for developers and it's, it's a difficult thing to do. It's not easy. And um, Anna sort of fit really well into that because she was like I know people who are trying to do this and I want to do the same thing and we started talking about not just green buildings because I think that's sort of a, a weird term that sort of tries to encompass a lot of things it's about it's about energy efficiency so it's it's an environmental aspect but it's also about healthy living so it's 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 a combination of two to three different things it's how you build the buildings it's how you live in the buildings and how you treat your environment. So there's there's really three main aspects to that, and um, and that's something that uh, that we've really found that we both 
could really wrap our heads around. And sometimes I think in our business, you know, we we love to to service our clients, and 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 that's what gives us joy. But sometimes you sort of lose track of what you're doing, and you get into this sort of just train where you're just riding it, and 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 you don't and you don't see the bigger picture of real estate in New York. And so it's really sort of nice to be able to actually have something where we can contribute to how real estate is evolving in, in New York City. And there's also the development. It's sorry. A, sorry to interrupt. A lot of the materials are now just much easier to find. So yeah. to, to bring this concept to somebody it, years ago, it would have cost them a lot more to, to put these put these ideas together into an actual building or product to deliver. I mean, now, you know, it's, it's, it's a common conversation piece and, you know, developers are, are keeping their eye on it. And especially now with the pandemic, I mean, everyone, everyone is super um, concerned about healthy living and how to breathe clean air. And it, this, this is the right time for, for something like that. I mean, developers, developers for years have spent, you know, thousands and thousands of dollars on, on, you know, using Lafroy Brooks instead of Grolo or something like that, where, you know, there's just water coming out of the faucet, but they never thought about the actual water that's coming out of the faucet, you know, right, of course. And, and that to me always sort of blew my mind because developers were like, you know, I'm not going to go green because it's going to cost me exponentially more, yet they were okay with using, you know, um, you know, the finest marbles from Italy and those types of things. And, and as, as nice as those things look, um, they don't actually, you know, help you live in a healthy home, which I think a lot of people are, are, are missing. So what are, the, what are some of the opportunities? By the way, I want to introduce you to uh, Scott Hobbs. Scott Hobbs in the, in the, is occupying the cell underneath Anna on my screen. He's um, he's a builder, by the way, and he's sitting in the dark. And I think that that means that's probably because he's trying to save energy right now. That's why he <laughs> only got a 20 watt bulb in his office. Um, Isn't so it a flashlight? He so may want to move in here. If you say the word lead, certified or platinum lead, he may leap out of his chair and have an opinion. I I'm just warning you about that. Feel free. That'd be great. I yeah, I, I would love to hear it because I have mine as well. I mean, I, I am actually the first broker and one of, I think, only two in, in New York who, who got uh, uh, who got lead accredited. Um, and it was probably the biggest waste of time that I ever did. <laughs> <laughs> but you get to say that you are. <laughs> I get to say that I am. But yes, no, I'm a, I'm a much more of a believer in... in in, in, in building with passive house technology, net zero, things like that, than sort of a bureaucratic lead system. Um, but I'd, I'd love to hear what, uh, what Mr. Hobbs has to say. I mean, I, I basically concur under that. There's, you know, the, the only good thing under lead is that it did actually change a lot of the zoning codes, or sorry, the building codes. And now, I mean, it's kind of a joke to get a lead certified house because I think basically every house is lead certified. I mean, if you're going to build a, a in a municipality like New York or Connecticut or New Jersey, almost like the narrow standards get you up to lead already. So trying to go beyond that, and then at the same time, trying just to figure out that whole cost benefit side is to, you know, are you saving $10,000 to, sorry, are you spending 10,000 to save $100 a year, or are you saving, you know, spending 10, you know, $500 in order to save $100 a year? And I mean, those yeah. end up being different items. And again, you just mm -hmm. want to discuss them and figure out what you're doing and, um, adjust it also the environment that you're working in. Yeah, no, no, no. I mean, there's so many aspects that, that fall in. I mean, one of my best examples is like if you if you bring in wood from let's say Ohio on a truck, it actually pollutes more than shipping it from France on a boat. Yeah, I, <laughs> so, yeah. So there's so there's there's all there, and there's a lot of greenwashing going on. I, I feel like it, especially in the lead program as well. That um, you know you can build a building that you you think you're living in this environmentally friendly and energy efficient building, but where they really got their lead points was from something else, you know, it was the, the gravel that they used in the parking lot. Um, and, you know, so I, I, think, in a bike I think there are, yeah, I mean, I think there are, there are other, there, there are much better, which is why I'm a big proponent of the passive house technology systems and also net zero is, you know, there's, there's much better ways of, of approaching this than, than the lead system. 
When we when we talk green, are we just talking about materials, or are we talking about a method of installation, uh, labor, and is the labor more expensive to, you know, to to use these items? You need a certain expertise. I think a lot of it has to do with with the air filtration systems and how tight the airflow within the seams of the building is. So I think it's more of a design based, um, but I, I, Bo would probably know better if um, you need to be specialized. I don't think so. Um, I mean, it, you don't need to, I mean, anybody can, can be taught how to put tape on a building and that's really what it is. It's taping up a building and then using the proper insulation and doing it properly. There's a lot of guys out there who do it wrongly, but but you know, to actually do it right is not that difficult. Um, there's a lot of builders, unfortunately, out there who don't know how to do it. So um, could you come into situations where somebody's gonna charge you a little bit more because they are knowledgeable? Yeah, probably. Um, but that's just a, you know, a supply and, and demand situation right now where the demand is a lot higher than, than the supply of these guys. When I first did my house, for example, which is a passive house, um, I got two quotes from normal builders without doing a passive house that was uh, that, that were higher than my my passive house construction guys. Define passive so, house. What's that mean? Passive house is basically um, it's a it's a guideline that was established in Darmstadt, Germany, by a a professor, and he set these mathematical guidelines where you can actually type it into a computer on your window size on the airflow that comes through your house. Um, so they measure that basically by taking a big fan, sucking all the air out of your house, and then they can, they can tell how much um, air is you know, creating a vacuum so they can tell how much air is coming into your house. Um, and then also your installation. And so all those are put into a formula, and then it has to meet certain guidelines to become a passive house. But what you can do, though, is use the passive house technologies that are out there you can you can put those together and not necessarily meet the passive house guidelines and still have an amazingly well done house and uh, and even the passive house guidelines have changed now from just being focused on energy efficiency to being focused on sustainability because those two mm -hmm. things are very different you know so before when a lot of people were using spray foam like the passive house guys are like now saying you know don't use spray foam use you know, materials that are not going to off-gas chemicals that are, you know, going to be a lot more sustainable. Woods, uh, cross-laminated timbers, um, um, using rock sole, things like that. So what I hear you saying is the first generation of being green meant to most consumers energy efficiency. Give me better insulation. Uh, let me use, let me consume less energy. Let me insulate my windows, insulate my walls. The next phase was not only saying, I want to use less energy, but I want cleaner air. And, yes. how, and whether that meant low VOCs or taping or, 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 or other methods, I want air quality. Yeah. You, that's the second wave. What's the next wave? Uh, I mean, I, I, I can show you this really quickly because I brought, I brought some props if you don't, if you don't mind. But this is, this is a New York uh, house in Brooklyn um and this this picture here shows after a month of using the air filter so this is incoming air into the house and this is what the new filter looks like uh this is another picture of one a coffee filter in the, in the bathroom yeah i mean i think that was just a picture of my windowsill <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I mean, so that is the air that you breathe, and it's not just it's not just the New York air that's polluted. It's also the air inside your home. So most uh, couches, um, carpets, all those things are um, um, old paints, things like that, are off gassing for years and years. So all those chemicals are are um, glues that we use in your house to to put everything together. Um, you know, when you have when you lay down floors and it's it's a floating floor, you have all this glue down there that's polyurethane, all this stuff, off gases. And uh, and when you're building airtight houses, you definitely notice that you will smell it and you will, you know, you, you need to get rid of those things. Um, so, you know, the, the, the amazing thing about living in, a, in an airtight house is that you have to bring in air constantly. All right. Um, Sorry about that. 
how much is it how how much are they asking for it do you have to sell them on the uh, or are consumers sufficiently sensitized to this that they're coming and saying i want a healthier building i want a healthier house i want scott i want you to build me something what are, what are my options are they asking for it yet i know that in the world of cars we all get uh, you know, the choices for a Tesla. We know what the sub the cost of the Tesla is. We know what the subsidy is. We know how much gas is going to save us. You know, the, the, the world's been educated. I don't think that the world's been educated on green, green building. And I don't know that they're asking for it yet. Are they? I don't think they're asking for it yet because uh, when you're coming into a place like New York City in, in particular, you kind of, you, you have your selections. And the majority of these buildings are just, they don't meet those standards. A lot of the new buildings coming in, and we'll discuss one that we're bringing to market, uh, have that option. They can do that. So I think for somebody to come in and say, I only want a clean building. I only want um, an envir environmentally friendly uh, living situation. I want a clean living situation. They're going to have maybe two or three buildings that are options for them. So they're not really coming and saying, this is how I want to live. But if, if, they're, if they're looking you know, at the scope of, of what's available to them, something like that will probably come up in their search. And that's when they'll, they'll have that option to say, you know what, this, I didn't know that this was an option for me. And now that I know about it, this is much more meaningful to me than you know, living on a particular street or, or you know, having however high ceilings or whatever it is. Um, and I think that people are getting a lot, a lot more educated. It started with the cars and um, it's, it, it's a conversation. I mean, with global warming and all of that, it's, all of this is just a conversation that people are having more and more and more. And they're, be, Anna, they're getting educated. Anna, will people pay a premium for that? I think so. I think so. I think, I think but, but at the same time, I mean, when, when we're comping our building, we're not really adding a premium for it because I, we don't really believe that you should have to pay for clean air. You know, we should pay extra for clean air, but you are you are buying a new con newly constructed building and there's a premium that comes with that. So uh, I, I think that you can probably add a premium to it. Um, Does it cost I, more to build? Does it cost more to build right, right now? Um, right it's, now. It's a tough question. I mean, yeah, I, I would say I would say it's almost it's pretty close to parity. Um, yeah. I, I would say it's maybe maybe you're looking at a five percent increase, maybe, um, but it's it's close to parity. It depends on so where you're. So is that a five percent increase that a developer would say, "Look, you know, let's do this." So I got to build in that five percent. Yeah, I mean, let's well, let's there's 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 definitely an economic aspect that people always think about, and I think, but. I think where the where the developers miss the point is that I think that um, and it, I think Tesla is the example, right? Nobody nobody thought that they needed a sixty thousand dollar electric car ten or fifteen years ago when the only option out there was a Nissan Leaf 1.0. Um, and Elon Musk went out there and he built it and he gave people that option and people then started to talk about it. And I think that's starting to happen. I can't tell you how many people have approached me and called me because I know that, you know, I'm involved with passive house technology who've called me and, and asked me, how can I do a passive house? And, you know, how can we build that? Uh, it, it's definitely a movement that's coming. And I also think, you know, it, it, all it takes is a few articles in the New York Times to talk yeah. about not just the energy efficiency, but also the health part of it. We spend thousands of dollars extra paying for organic foods. I remember my dad when like organic foods started to become popular like 20 years ago or 15, whatever, yeah, 20 years ago. He was like, eh, it's humbug, why pay the extra for it? And a lot of people said that. And now everybody's buying organic foods. And why would you not, you know, you're, you're putting a few chemicals from a banana into your body. Why would you not want to live in a place where you're not putting all those like exponentially more chemicals into your body from the air than, yeah, than, than you would from food. But I, I think also it's important to note that um, in, a developer that does it right, they also, they shouldn't be doing it as a fad or as a trend. They should be doing it because it's a passion of theirs. And that's the only way that they're gonna do it right. The developer that we're working with, he makes choices based on how is this going to be the, the best product and this might cost a little bit more money, but it's it's going to be it's going to be the lower VOC option. 
and that's what we're that's what we're going for because it's important to him and it's meaningful to him. So to do it right, it, there, there's it's got to be somewhat innate. Scott Hobbs, I know you're dying to dive in here. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, we're yapping, we're yapping. Well, <laughs> Scott, Scott apartments in the city. Andy does houses. And so I heard it uh, might only cost a 5% premium. Can you comment on that? Well, the, there's, there's questions as to how far you want to go. And, and that drives a lot of the cost. And so, I mean, yeah. one difference for us is that we're doing custom products. So literally we're working with specific owners who get to see the price tags and get to decide how far they want to go. We, we start at a very high level. And then you can tweak it going up. But if somebody has like asthmatic children, if they have really bad allergies, if they have something serious, you can really kind of, you know, get the air quality even up to a whole different level. But now you're doing a lot more HEPA filters. You're doing a lot more treatments of air. You're exchanging air differently. You're doing, it, it has to be a little bit, you have to do something different that can add to the cost. On the other hand, for like spec builders, it's not unusual for a speculative builder in a house to have a mechanical system that costs half of what we would start as kind of our basic model inside of the homes that, that clients want from us. So it's, it's, I mean, you're still allowed to go ahead and, and not do things the way that you really want to. And I'm sure that happens in the big buildings too. I, I'd say one slight difference is of course in the bigger buildings um, with 30 or 40 or 50 or 60 apartments or hundred, the, the, there's an ownership element to the overall efficiency of the building that hopefully they end up taking some sort of understanding. And again, in New York City, air quality does take on a whole different meeting than, than, the, oh, yeah. than the country. I mean, you got allergies I, in the country, but. I, th I, think, I think the car example is, is, is good here. An analogy is that it costs very little to buy a car that will go from zero to 60 in, in eight seconds to, to upgrade it to one that does it in six seconds, but it costs a lot of money to get one that goes from two seconds to 1.8 seconds. Um, and I think it's the same in, in buildings like this. So, I mean, you can really, you know, you can add a lot to buildings. Uh, we were just talking with our, uh, with our developer this morning and with our architects. And, and he was saying, you know, we've been thinking about adding um, this, this LED UV system into the building that, that you know, basically kills all the viruses um, in, in, the, uh, in the air ducts. And I was like, yeah, you know, that, that sounds great but it's going to cost a lot of money and that it what what is it going to give you at the end of the day and and those types of things i think you know it's like it's like going from uh you know waterworks up to to uh to lefroy brooks right i mean that it costs a lot more but is it really is still just getting water out of the faucet and I don't know if it looks and, and that then there's also better, but, yeah. there's also the maintenance aspect of something like that. I mean, to maintain something like that and keep it clean, yes. that's a that's a monster of a job. So when I've asked Scott, what, what, let's get specific on on our on our choices here. When I built my house uh, five years ago, I decided to uh, do geothermal heating and cooling because it would save me money over the long, because it was an economic decision and the government was offering 20% tax break. So I could rent 20% of it off. So that was an easy decision. But when I went to Scott and I said, well, what's the next level up? He said, well, you would get air exchangers. You would want to bring in fresh air. You wouldn't want to just a sealed envelope. You want to exchange air and get new fresh air and conditioned. And you have to. You want that? And I was like, I don't think I need that. I mean, <laughs> I don't think I need that. The next level is, do you want your air humidified? Do you want the humidity control so that in the winter, the humidity doesn't drop too low and in the summer, you know, go too high. And I didn't appreciate, right? So I can appreciate the economics that I can measure. But I can't appreciate the healthiness, which is what you were talking about, the healthiness of air scrubbers and humidifiers and air exchangers. So I still think they're not well understood. They're not well understood by me. I do have fancy filters. My filters cost me $60 each. They're like five inches fat. They're like Merv 12. And, uh, <laughs> and then I swap them out every six months. And then I feel like, okay, I did enough. I don't need to go to, you know, I don't need to go to the 1.8 second, you know. Yeah, yeah. You went to you went to like 85%. Yeah, no, no, which is, but which is, which is fine. I mean, that's fine. The, the only thing you have most. to be careful of, 
and that I really want to like tell everybody out here is, and this is the mistake that a lot of like construction people and developers and, and homeowners are making right now is that they're going in and they're using, for example, zip systems, which are these ports that go up, they get taped up and you can actually seal a house pretty easily and very in inexpensively with them. And what happens is that sometimes you seal up the houses and you do need to have airflow. And if you don't have the airflow, you will get mold. Um, and so this, this happened back like 20 years ago in Germany, um, which, you know, like every other house that's built now is, is passive house uh, standard. Uh, but 20 years ago, they, a lot of guys came out and, and they didn't know what they were doing. And there was a huge crisis because all these homes had mold in them. Um, but you need to, yeah. So, so if, you, if you're gonna seal up your house, we have that problem. hyper insulated. You need to have an ERV that circulates fresh air into the home, but which is also amazing because when you're like sleeping, all you do is breathe out CO2. Your bedroom is just filled with CO2. Fresh air coming in every day. I only need to sleep like two hours a night because I've got fresh oxygen coming in my in my bedroom every night. Uh, like it's amazing. Like look at me. I'm like the freshest guy around. That's so, my light match in there. <laughs> <laughs> So that I, why I'm not selling five hundred million dollars because I'm not getting enough fresh air. And you're not getting enough oxygen. That's the problem. Yes. Now I know. Yeah. yeah. See that so, in Colorado, so, they have like they have oxygen bars, and this I never understood that they have like oxygen bars, you know, up in like Aspen and stuff. They charge you like you know five hundred dollars for an hour of sitting there and, and sucking air. <laughs> so, so let me let me just ask. We we're talking a lot about employing these things, but it's all from a development standpoint, a new development. What if someone lives in a pre-war building or even a post-war building, but they want to live cleaner, they want to live, you know, more sustainably, what can they do within their own apartment or can they not um, to, to, you know, to go down this path? I think it's, I, it's, it's difficult. I mean, I think, I think what you can look at is you can look at the materials that you are bringing into your home. So if you're going to sand your floors, um, you know, do a, a natural oil finish, don't do a polyurethane finish. If you, uh, if you can get the building to replace the windows, use a good quality, at least dual pane uh, window that, you know, has, has a high quality. Um, all those things will will definitely matter at the end of the day. And I mean, we all know building boards. So unfortunately, sometimes, you know, if they can't even decide to change the doorbell, it takes them 10 years. But, you know, for the for the most part, I think that, you know, you know, there, there's very inexpensive technology out there that you can use or, or options out there that you can use today that are not going to cost you um, a lot more money. So. But so if someone gut renovates an apartment on Park Avenue, they have an eight-room apartment on Park Avenue, they're going to completely gut it. They, there are things that they can do yeah. and employ. Oh, totally. Yeah, okay. totally. I mean, I mean, if you're looking at pre-war buildings, I mean, a lot of those buildings are amazing. They were built uh, so well. They don't build buildings like that anymore. They've got thick walls. You can insulate on the inside of them. And uh, if you use a triple pane window on those, which will keep sound out as well, you can totally you, you, you again you have to be careful so you, you probably have to put in an erb because you can you can insulate those extremely well um i mean i sit in my home when it's 20 below out by the window and i do not feel a draft and the same temperature the same environment is there when it's 100 degrees out there's no change in my home i like i never i never have to put on sweaters or take off my clothes it's always like yeah just a comfortable environment. All right, we've got 15 minutes to go. We can keep going on green building, or you can tell us about the current environment in New York. I mean, I, I want to know what's going on because I heard there was this pandemic and the market was a little bit soft. <laughs> For about the last two weeks, three weeks, the media really seems to be uh, ca ca calling for a, a sharply upward trajectory in New York. Is that the case? Absolutely. It's been, it's been the case. It's been on, on the way up since December. Um, and it's, I mean, a, a true New Yorker doesn't give up on believing in New York. So we believe in New York and it, it, every, everything comes around. We've been in the business a long time and has, have gone through 
so many different um, natural disasters and man-made disasters and New York always comes back. Obviously this is a very different animal, but uh, starting with December, I mean, the prices had adjusted so well towards a buyer's market and a lot of people were able to finally build equity in New York, finally buy an apartment, buy a family apartment, buy a starter apartment, whatever they wanted, you know, whatever they wanted, they were priced back in. So once that started happening, and then there was a little bit of, of media that went around it, you know, you get one article and then you get more people kind of diving in because they're afraid they're missing the bottom. Then you get another article. And then lately there's just been a lot of really positive press, which is great, but now everything is, there are bidding wars everywhere. People are really, really coming out of the woodwork and saying, okay, we're, we're on the upswing. That's very clear, but the prices are still, it's still very, very price sensitive. So you can't really start increasing prices until the pandemic is, you know, relatively done. And, but at the same time, bidding wars are increasing those prices anyway. So th there's, there's a mentality about, you know, I've, I've missed the bottom, but the, the pricing is still not at the top, so it's still a really good time to buy. Yeah, the good the good inventory is is almost gone. I mean, it's almost gone. Yeah, there, yeah. I mean, there's some apartments out there that are still, I think, steals, but there's very few and far between on those. There's some that have been sitting on the market that I think you can get a steal on, but besides that, I mean, the good inventory is not out there, and it's not coming on the market either. Uh, people are are not selling; they're staying in the city. And I think a lot of people are realizing, you know, there's no Broadway in Naples, Florida. You know, there's no, there's there's no Met or Guggenheim in Scarsdale. I'm sorry, but New York is, you know, the most amazing city in the world. And yeah. and and it's fine to go on vacation for a year, uh, you know, out in the Hamptons or 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 uh, you know, down in Florida. But when it comes to it, you know, I think people are realizing. There's a reason why they fell in love with New York in the first place, yeah. and people will come back. And I think we're looking at the Roaring Twenties, and real estate prices are going to recover extremely quickly. Really? I mean, I remember back in like 2008, 2009, I had guys out there who were like, "Oh, the market's going to keep going down, keep going down." They missed out on so much by yeah. 2010. They were like, "Whoa!" They were gone. <laughs> yeah. It was What's like Formula good? One yeah. and a lot of going by them. What's good inventory mean? What's good? Uh, good condos, inventory is... I've heard condos are hot, co-ops not so much. Are we looking at brownstones? Are we talking about... Oh, just, no, oh, yeah. I don't think it's a category. I think it's more like good light, good views, some outdoor space, good condition, good quality, things like that. Um, yeah, good neighborhood. But I will like... also say that, that so many people were so concerned about the longevity of New York because people could now work from home and they understand that they can work from home. So why would they want to pay New York City prices? And you know, to Bo's point, people want to pay New York City prices because once you're when you're when you're spending all your time sitting in your computer in your house or in your apartment, the last thing you want to do is walk out of your apartment and there's no one around. In New York, you can actually still socialize. There, you know, you walk down the street and there's people bundled up in the middle of the winter sitting outside. You know, I want to get more specific. I want to know. I want to know how it's changed. I'm going to give you an analogy. In Connecticut, the pandemic has caused the commute, commutable towns to be less important because of the pandemic, because people are taking uh, the trains less and commuting into the city less. So it's changed, it's changed the equation out in the suburbs. What are some of the changes that are occurring in New York City as a result of the pandemic that causes something to be good inventory? Do I care about subways as much as I used to, subway accessibility? Or is the Lower East Side just fine these days? Lower East Side is just fine, I will say. Yeah, that's, that's, <laughs> uh, I, I, I've been you're, very busy. But, you're talking um, about a blip on the radar. It's a blip exactly. on the radar. Everything will everything will come back. It is there. Exactly. Yes, there are going to be will some more people who are going to work from home. But yeah, all those commuter towns you're talking about, Connecticut. I will tell you that because you know you guys out there have a lot of people who've moved out there. You know, traffic's going to increase exponentially over the next year. Uh, I will guarantee you that that uh, I'm pretty sure that in a year and a half you will see a flight out of Connecticut because. There are going to be guys out there who don't want to necessarily live out there because they want to live in New York. Nothing against Connecticut. I love Connecticut. But there are guys out there who want to be in the city. And 
And all of a sudden, you know, they're going to be like, I don't want to sit in traffic for two hours a day. And uh, I actually, I love, I love listening to people make their predictions, whatever the disaster is, whether it's, you know, Lehman crash in 2008 or this. People make their predictions and they're so steadfast in their belief that, you know, either New York is done or no one's ever going back into offices again. I mean, I want your they're... predictions. I want your predictions. <laughs> <laughs> my prediction, my prediction. You just heard our predictions. If, You've heard our predictions. My, our predictions. 100%. 100%. Yeah. I mean, it, I, it's, it, I think it was hilarious that, that, um, that Jerry, that remember that article, Jerry Seinfeld, yeah wrote and it was it was in retaliation to i forget who wrote something about New York comic guy who guy who owns stand up new york and he's a finance guy exactly so it, it, it went back and forth between them a couple of times and i mean it was fascinating because you can't make these or you shouldn't make these big predictions in an unprecedented time in our life we really have no idea or we had no idea how things were going to pan out but at the, at the end of the day, I mean, New York is still going to be New York. Broadway is always going to come back. I mean, to me, that it was just, it, it felt really silly when people were, were to make those predictions and say that, you know, something that's such a monumental part of Manhattan is just never going to come back. But, but Anna, Anna in, in that itself, you are also making a prediction, which we all, I'm a believer in New York, like nobody's business. And it's our also our collective predictions that are trying to change the narrative, which is making everybody feel that, you know what, it's okay. It's okay. Everything's exactly. cool here. Well, I mean, the, the negative predictions were all just very short sighted. This is what's happening right now. And if things don't change based on what's happening right now, then sure, those predictions could have come true. But we all knew that at some point, this was all going to come to an end. We're not there yet, but we will be. And to, to have that long, to have that long term belief that's really i don't think it's a prediction i think it's just a hold on take a deep breath people everything's sure. gonna be fine you know I mean, there's it's, also it's, there's there's positives that come out of pandemics you know there there are as as awful as this has been there are positives that are going to come out of it there's curbside dining i am pretty sure that the city is going to grandfather in curbside dining for restaurants now uh, which means more space. Freaking more havoc on parking, but exactly. Yeah, oh, all right, fine, whatever. But there's no parking anymore, anyway. So you can't park on the Upper West Side if you park try. <laughs> you know, actually, maybe they'll get rid of cars. That's that's fine with me too. Like they have in London. Um, but it, you know, they've got curbside dining. There's got there's walking streets. You know, things like pedestrian streets popping up everywhere. I think those are things that hopefully the administration will and future administration here in New York will appreciate and see and and bring forward because I think those things will only enhance the city and uh, and make it a more livable city and uh, I, I hope that that's that's going to be the trajectory that we're on and I think it is yeah I'm going to be I'm going to be positively optimistic about that all right give me one hot property or one hot neighborhood as a that that you know is currently hot and getting hotter I'll give you an example backcountry Greenwich seem to be out of favor. It would take you 20 minutes uh, to get from backcountry Greenwich, you know, downtown to get your groceries. The pandemic has caused the four acre zone in North Stanford, North Greenwich, uh, Wilton to be suddenly, you know, popular. And, and I predict that that will last for this next several years, whether or not we have a pandemic or not. What's the equivalent in New York? That's a tough one, I think. Um... I mean, the, the, the tried and true neighborhoods like the West Village, Upper West Side, Upper East Side, they're still tried and true. Um, I've, I've, I've experienced something really interesting in the Lower East Side where I live in that the prices didn't really dip all that much to begin with, or maybe in just the co-op environment where I am, it just didn't. And it, it's, it's a really a destination spot for a lot of people, but it has been for a long time. So I'm not sure that that um, answers your question necessarily, but it, that's definitely not changing or going away. Um, I mean, and I think, and I think there, there are some, there are some neighborhoods that are, you know, that that people started living in because they couldn't afford to be more central. Those might die down a little bit because they're too far from transportation. So it's, I think that's a tough one. To, to me, I would say actually around you, 
um, yeah. on the Lower East Side. I mean, with Essex yeah. Market, and I think it's changed from being yeah. sort of like this like loud and boisterous bar scene to really being a livable area. Oh. <laughs> it, yeah. yeah, it is. I mean, I I know I know the Lower East Side intimately, but I also live in the lower half of it. So I live south of Delancey where it's not, you don't have a crazy bar scene there. Um, it's just a very, very different um, different culture. But the, I mean, the, with Essex Crossing and all the amenities that brought to a neighborhood that desperately, desperately needed it, that was well before the pandemic. They continued work through the pandemic. There's gonna be a ton more coming in over the next couple of years. They're gonna be upgrading the, um, the East River Park, which you know is to a, a lot of people's dismay, but I think ultimately it will be a good thing. And I, I mean, all of these things contributed to a, 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 an area that really kind of needed it. And that doesn't go away because there's a pandemic. It actually makes it that much more livable because during a pandemic, I was there the entire time. I, I didn't go away until the summer and it was absolutely wonderful to be there there's a lot of there are a lot of parks there's a lot of open space um, people are really respectful of each other and um it's 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 de i've definitely seen an uptick in you know how do i how do i get an apartment in your building i mean it, it's it's miraculous and the prices as i said they didn't really dip through you all of this well, you, uh, but you're li you live a little uh, close to one manhattan square right um yeah ish maybe a 10 minute walk is, is there any is there any light at the end of the tunnel for that building? <laughs> I mean, uh, it, it's, it's tough. It's tough. The I mean, multiplicity it, of product that they have is insane. Yeah. It's insane. Yeah, yeah. So the, the issue with that, uh, first of all, it's a gorgeous building. The amenities yeah. are stunning. The location happens to be really great. You're not that far from the F train. I happen to love the F train. A lot of people don't. But I mean, the the, the issue with that is that there are these um, communities, the Knickerbocker development for one is right around there. And that's a huge community that isn't gonna be going anywhere. It's not really changing the, the, the dynamic or the landscape of it. Where if you, you know, like Hudson Yards, for example, you build something crazy there, you can also build around it to make sure that the amenities match the building or, or the, the neighborhood amenities match the building. It, that The opportunity for that isn't quite there there. You, you don't have there, the retail. There. Yeah. Um, I mean, the, there's a couple of rental buildings coming into the neighborhood too, but I live in a, a, one of those old co-op developments and we're, we're, they're massive, massive structures with tons of people. I happen to love that. And I love like the, the culture and the diversity that that brings, but somebody, you know, that wants those crazy amenities, they also want to walk out their door and have other options. And you do have to walk a few blocks to have those other options. Yeah, there's no there's no retail there. I mean, there's and there's no room for like organic growth. And that's I think I think they missed the boat on that one. Um, I'm going to throw in just Brooklyn as a whole. I mean, Brooklyn yeah. sailed through this pandemic just like 2008 prices. You, in Brooklyn? you know, there may be a couple of good deals, but that was it. Yeah, Spell lives in Brooklyn. Brooklyn. Yeah, he's in Brooklyn. Yeah, yeah. I live in Dimas Park. I love Dimas Park. It's like living in Mayberry with all the. Uh, with all the amenities of, of a big city and, and, and a 50 minute drive to, uh, to Tribeca or a 30 minute uh, train into, uh, into Union Square. Have you so. been there, John? Have you been there? If I dropped you there, you wouldn't know where you are. You, you wouldn't <laughs> think you're in New York. You think you're in Greenwich. You wouldn't. Yeah. It's amazing. And it's important to note that it's a standalone house. It's not a townhouse. Yeah. yeah. So whenever uh, somebody talks about their house in New York, you're thinking townhouse. This is a standalone with a yard. That is expensive. Yeah. They're they're about they're about to list a uh, an eleven million dollar house around the corner from me, which is crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, nor normally most of the houses they used to go for you know or you know 10, 15 years ago they were going for a million dollars at the most, and then they've been creeping up now over over the three million dollar price point for uh for these Victorian two and a half to, to three and a half, and uh, but there's a couple of big mansions in the neighborhood on Albemarle that are just, I mean, they're stunning. And uh, they've got one coming on right now for, uh, for 11 million. That 11 million house must be green, right? Uh, I wish it was. <laughs> <laughs> so 
So one thing I haven't heard about is the mix of jobs. I think that Wall Street is shrinking in terms of the number of jobs, but I think it's more than being made up for, according to the press, by uh, tech. Tech is moving into New York. Oh, Are yeah. you seeing that? Are you seeing uh, a new young tech worker coming in, coming into, into the brokerages and saying, you know, I've been transferred to New York. I need a place where are the cool neighborhoods, you know. Uh, I think that's gonna come more and more um, as the office space develops because it's not really developed yet. There are some, you know, spaces for Google, but the, the amount of square of office space square footage that Google, Amazon, IBM um, have has committed to is extraordinary for people that really could probably work from home. Several um, million feet. Yes. Oh yeah, no, no, no. We have a, so, we have that, a small rental storage. Yeah, so once once that's built, we're going to see a lot more of it, but a lot of it is still in the works. But the, but we, we, have small, that sure. uh, we have a small uh, $3,000 rental in, in uh, Chelsea, and every third person coming through there is a programmer, either for Facebook or for Google. And what does the, program, the, the programmer for Facebook or Google, what is their target uh, shelter? What are they looking for? Are they saying, I just want a rental? I want to buy, I need a co-op, I need a co condo. Do they say I'm looking five years out or I want my forever house? What, what is the young tech worker asking for? Uh, it, it, depends on the, it depends on the age, right? So the younger ones are just looking for great neighborhoods with bars, and, you know, everything that New York gives you, right? That's what they're looking for. Uh, I, think the, I think the older tech workers definitely are, are some of the ones who pumped up Brooklyn, um, you know, townhouses, Things like that, but also Soho, Tribeca, you know, have seen a huge influx of uh, of tech guys. Um, I think even more so than than Wall Street guys right now. I mean, most of most of the uh, the sales I think that we've done downtown have been a pretty good mix of people who are either in tech um, and and less so in, in finance these days. Are they are those groups? Gonna, you didn't say Upper West Side. You didn't say Upper East Side. Are they sort of? Uh, old lady neighborhoods or are they going to become hip too? Yeah, it's, it's hard to hippify the Upper East Side, but you know, there's, there's, there, there, are, are, there, are, there, are, there are areas, there are yes. pockets, there are pockets that are actually coming around with, with, and, and you know what, and it's the great thing about the Upper East Side and Upper West Side, I mean, both of them, they're right on Central Park. So you have this amazing right. park right at your doorstep. Uh, and if you're on the other side, you know, you got Riverside and you, you got East River Park. There's, there's all these, there's all these great outdoor spaces up there. And, and what they were missing was a little bit of coolness factor, right? I mean, they were missing art galleries and, and, uh, yeah. and cool restaurants, but those are, they're coming in and they don't but also, they were coming. Yeah. And also the, the, you know, the people that were priced out of Manhattan are priced back in and, and especially in those neighborhoods, because yeah, the further sure. east, the further east you go, you can actually find something on East End Avenue that is light and beautiful for, you know, for a price that you would never have imagined, especially, you know, given that there is a train closer to it with the queue now. Um, but but there there are some buyers that I'm that I'm working with that are really excited they can actually build some equity in New York and they didn't necessarily want to be uptown but we're looking uptown because they can actually get a home for their entire family that is comfortable for now you know yeah, Anna, like Anna before, before no prices get crazy to, again Anna and I no longer have to bring our passports when we go up there right. <laughs> <laughs> we no Go longer get nosebleeds either <laughs> Brian, can I throw, can I throw something in about the about the upper west side um, yeah. I, I know a little bit about it. You do. Um, and, and, and if you look at if you look at Greg Heim's inventory report, the two bedroom market is a seller's based on absorb. Every market other than the three bedroom market is a balanced market, leaning more towards a seller's market. By the end of May or the beginning of June, it will be a seller's market in every market on the Upper West Side, with the exception yes. of the three bedroom market. Agreed. So, um, and it is, and and it, it doesn't have the cool factor for a very good reason. It is not supposed to be a cool neighborhood. It is a family neighborhood. It has, you know, people talk about Central Park. The heck with Central Park. You want to go to a park, go to Riverside Park, where nobody goes. And and lastly, and please take this the right way, John. 
okay? And anybody from Connecticut, because I love Connecticut. But you guys needed a pandemic of a market, out of the hell of a market. We, we, we're not worried about the pandemic. New York stands all by itself. It doesn't need any help. Connecticut needed a pandemic for the, for the market to turn around. Um. <laughs> I, I, I had to defend New York. I had to defend New York. It's hard. It's hard to stump John. Yeah, yeah. No. But I want to tease out of that. So if I'm look, if I'm in the market looking, it, what I hear you saying is that in a balanced market, you talked about a whole lot of sellers' markets, but you said there's balance in the two bedroom sector. That that to me the means sellers' market. Everything else is about. Okay. Except for the oh. three-bed market, which is still a buyer's market. So the studio buyer, market. So I can get my deals uptown. All the deals, I should start uptown if I'm looking for a deal. I'm not going to yeah, get it. Most part, yeah. The inventory no. on the Upper West Side, one of the things that's helping the Upper West Side is the inventory is very tight. Yes. Yeah. And that's why it's a seller's market. And that's why the two-bedroom market is a seller's market. Okay. Because you have a reduced, you, you, your inventory is getting eaten up. And new stuff isn't coming on. And your studio one bedroom markets are, are now a little bit more in balance between sellers and buyers, but leaning, but moving much more quickly to the seller right now. Yeah. Okay. So it's no longer a buyer's market. Larger apartments is a buyer market. And, that's, and, and that's, that's been the case for a long while. I mean, that has yeah, nothing to do with the pandemic. I think I think the Upper West Side versus the Upper East Side too. The the architecture appeals to more people who are moving oh, yeah. to New York or buying New York. I mean, the architecture for the most part, uh, you know, on the Upper West Side is is post. I mean, pre-war. Whereas you know, you get you get east of of Lex, and uh, and it's mostly post-war uh, stuff on the Upper Upper East yeah. Side, and that's totally that's where you really are getting your deals because you know you've got low ceiling heights, they're big buildings, they're maybe not as sexy um, architecturally speaking, they're like blah, you know, but you can actually create great apartments in there. Um, you know, you live you live on the inside of an apartment, you don't live on the outside of a building. So I think that there's actually a lot of opportunity there to come in and make great yeah. apartments uh, on the Upper East Side and get a deal. All right, so three bedrooms on the Upper East Side, it'd be an opportunity for somebody to say, trade up from a two bedroom to a three exactly. bedroom. Exactly. Yeah. And start there. And if they couldn't find it on the Upper East Side, where else would they go? Oh, I mean, there's uh, tons of places. Mid-counties. Mid-counties, yeah. okay. Yeah, Mur Murray Hill, Kitts Bay, those areas. I would also go further north. You know, I would go up in Harlem. I would go up to Washington Heights. All those neighborhoods are, are definitely hot right now. And definitely. they are, I think they're great investments. Um, there's a lot of people who are moving, you know, further north. Yeah. Well, if everything in your neighborhood is trading at $11 million, then we're definitely going <laughs> to stay out of Brooklyn. And it sounds like Anna's neighborhood, the Lower East Side, is way too hip and, and cool. <laughs> You can come visit. I'll, I'll shield you and protect you as we walk the streets. Don't worry. <laughs> we give everybody Kevlar vests. <laughs> I grew up in Stuyvesant Town from 1967, oh. uh, 69 to 1980. And uh, the son of Sam was, was out. Yeah. Uh, Mayor Beam and then Mayor Koch were running the show. And I was told, do not go south of 14th Street. Do not go south of 14th Street. And if I did, I might get mugged for my skateboard or, or whatever. <laughs> so yeah. uh, when I mentioned this to Bo yesterday, he said the scariest thing in the Lower East Side was, was what? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that, that, woman, that woman from Jersey or Queens or whatever who went nuts at Essex Market. <laughs> oh my god <laughs> the the -mask wear, you know, that like, was that's... that was insane that was livid about that but john i know you're going to ask me about astor place barber yes <laughs> my son actually so john john's question to me off camera was um can you still get an eight dollar haircut at astor place barbershop so first of all my son goes there he started going there when when it was 16 a haircut it is now up to 23 dollars a haircut Oh. Which is crazy, twenty three dollars. John, um, you're priced out. And it's, seriously, 
And, but I will say that this is, this is a kind of nice story to maybe wrap on because Astro Barber was, was going to close because of the pandemic. There was no business to be had on a, they were supposed to close on a Tuesday. That Tuesday, somebody came in and bought them because they, they wanted to keep the barbershop open because it's such an institution. So by that, by the Wednesday after that, they were back in business full swing. Literally it happened overnight. Wow. That's fabulous. Isn't it great? Can but I now, now we bring our son somewhere else because it's too expensive. <laughs> is, is Canal Street Jeans still there? I don't think so. <laughs> that well, one I'm a, not really sure about. Canal, Canal Street's actually going through a huge metamorphosis. Canal okay. Street's going to be pretty incredible. Give it it's a few years, be, but it's going to be It's definitely, incredible. it's going to be too hip for me soon. It's okay. going to be incredible. All right. But well, it's going to be like 42nd Street, that what it used to be in Times Square, and, and it's going to become that? No, 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 no. Okay. No, 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 no. no you, we're you've talking. Got loft, you've got beautiful cast iron loft buildings on both ends. Yeah. It's a one street that divides two of the hot, the city's hottest neighborhoods. I'm, I'm surprised it hasn't happened already, but it no, you're talk, you're, we're talking about guys like Keith McNally coming in and opening restaurants. Yes. That's ah, you're talking that's Huskies, good. Baltazar style. It's very good. It's a great to... street. Yeah. It really is a great street. So if I want to make a 20 year bet, I might look in that neighborhood because you're yes. saying that, um, you know, I, I don't necessarily need the deal of the year, but if I'm sticking around for 20 years, I should look downtown because some of these fabulous restaurants are coming in and, 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 and it's just- Well, what you have in a lot of these buildings, especially along Canal is um, rent stabilized tenants who have been there for 40 years. Uh, I would buy those lofts, buy, wait for them to, you know, kick it a little bit um, or a lot um, or just buy them out. But at, at some point, if you just buy them, let those people live their lives, at, those will be worth so much more money someday. Yeah, Within look at Tribeca. Tribeca. Tribeca used to be like three blocks by like seven blocks. Now it's like 200 blocks by 500 blocks, you know? I mean, it's all expanding, you know, very quickly down there. You know, tr Broadway south of, south of Canal right there, that stretch has really changed. A friend, yeah. one of my colleagues used to call it, because people would say, oh, this is Tribeca. He's like, no, that's Tribeca that's stand. Yeah, yeah. So oh. <laughs> it's, uh, but it's, it's, that's got a lot of run, runway. Yeah. yeah. And, yeah. It, and it's beautiful. Yep. Oh, I yeah. love ending the show with a tip, like a big secret. Like I'm going to go to <laughs> Wall Street winnings and I'm heading down to Canal Street. I, am <laughs> I love this. All right. And everyone Thank on the show you, gets Anna. 10% of your earnings. <laughs> Thank you, man. <Anna. laughs> oh. Thank you so much for having us on. Thanks, Thank guys. You guys. Thank you so much. All right. And uh, Scott, good to see you, Michael, Itzy. And, and to have a cup of coffee with you down on uh, maybe Astor Place. Hi, Roberto. Absolutely. It would be, be my pleasure and my treat. Hey, Hi, Michael. Hi, everyone. See you guys. <laughs> I want some love too here. Hi. Hi, Tammy. Hi. 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 Hi, Tammy. Johnny. <laughs> We'll see you. Hey, we apologize, Tammy. You know, it's the New York crew. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm a loyalist. Connecticut, Connecticut love. We love I'm, Connecticut. I'm a loyalist. John knows I'm a fan. <laughs> <laughs> we love Tammy. We love you back. I'll be showing in two minutes. I got to go. Bye, everyone. <laughs>